Hello and welcome to episode 16 of my Kerbal Space Program NASA series. We're picking up exactly where we left off on the last video with the Mooner Fuel Depot on its uh, transition. <clears throat> However, during that uh, transfer, I got an alert that the Skylab was running out of f food and it was probably getting around time to remove the return the crew, so the decision was made to launch Billy Bobden, Roderick, and Rory Kerman aboard the Space Shuttle Explorer. <clears throat> to retrieve the long duration crew from Skylab. Just a standard uh, space shuttle launch. It's only notable thing is that it's happening at night for once. But it's all just pretty, uh, I'm gonna, I am gonna put that uh, crew pod set up into standard rotation because it's been so effective. Uh, it really, it doesn't affect the, it affects the dynamics of the shuttle in a positive way on re-entry. It makes it a little heavier, but that just means it holds its mo uh, momentum easier, so. Blowing off the SRBs, then dropping the main tank in the atmosphere. And for some reason I was getting some frame rate issues. Um, I, I think it's just the vagaries of KSP 64-bit because after I quit and reloaded, um, it and the Skylab were loading perfectly, so. I'm trying to minimize delta V on the transfers here, so I have result. I've gone back to orbit phasing, but also I had to keep in mind that I have a piece of heavy equipment on pretty much an escape trajectory, so I had to go back to it after fine-tuning that approach, so we can make sure this thing gets captured and doesn't punt off into a weird orbit. And this was a completely unplanned piece of infrastructure that I really wasn't intending on using. I just had to Unfortunately, I like I said in the previous video, I overestimated how much Delta V my transfer stage had, or even the rocket that carried my uh, Skycrane into orbit, so the Skycrane ended up having to complete its transfer orbit under its own power, and it just doesn't have Delta V to, do, to deliver Excuse me, the uh, payload we're trying to put down. And the crew expertly maneuvers the space shuttle in for a close encounter with Skylab. They're actually pretty close already, but that purple intercept showed that we would have a sub-kilometer sub approach, so we decided to go with that. Just chasing this thing around the planet. Since we are in the lower orbit, we are moving slightly faster. And then it switches over to a 4.4-kilometer intercept instead of the 800 meters that it told me it was. So, that was fun. But it's all just relatively low drama. We burn off that relative velocity so we can make our rendezvous. And there's really no point in opening the cargo bay doors um, on my space shuttle in this flight just because um, everything's going on with the crew tank. I don't, well, I take it back. That's the only docking port, so. And I don't know why I put those uh, range extension tanks on there. Um, I just, I guess I got a little paranoid. Not like it mattered anyway, but. Oh well. Burning in to make our rendezvous. Now, the real space shuttle, regardless of what they were carrying, once they got to orbit, the um, cargo bay doors act as radiators, acted as radiators to burn off or radiate excess heat. And interestingly enough, if you use B9 Aerospace and you do play with Interstellar, those cargo doors um, become graphene radiators as far as Interstellar is concerned, which I thought was a really cool um, little feature they had in there last time I played with Interstellar, which was quite a while ago. But I love this docking camera, and you can really see the frame rates here messing up here. It was doing it when I made my rendezvous to deliver the crew also. I just had that sped up to four times timing acceleration so you didn't notice it. Um, I really don't know what was going on. Like I said, it's probably just one of those random 64-bit issues that I'm running into. It wasn't a game breaker. I was still able to fly, obviously. But, and I actually came back and I docked this thing and then I was away from the game for a couple days before I came back to finish this. So I ended up having to... Uh, Refigure out what all my controls were because it'd been a while since I'd been playing. Not a huge deal, but 
had to retrain muscle memory. Which was basically, I just figured, forgot what my, the layout for that um, toolbar was. So I was hunting around for crew manifest and just about clicking on chatterer and any other icon I could grab. And while we're here, we're going to go ahead and refresh the station. Um, the shuttle's going back. It doesn't need these resources as much as the station will. I'm trying to follow mom's advice and leave it in a better condition than what you found it in. We're going to haul off the waste, restock all the life support systems and speed everything up because so, it gets a little te tedious. But yeah, I'm actually surprised at just how effective this space shuttle is. Um, I can carry a heavy payload and a three Kerbal crew, or I can put a crew tank on there. And I originally thought about flying a Soyuz up unmanned to return the crew, but I've got four Kerbals up here, and the Soyuz will only carry th uh, three on return. That extra... The extra pod on the front, that is just extra living conditions. I think I've mentioned this before, provided... Because it's going to be the escape pod for the KSS. If the crew has to beat a hasty retreat, we can hold five Kerbals in the Soyuz for a long, for a pretty long duration um, while they wait for rescue. But this shuttle is uh, pretty much my only hope of getting at the moment. It's the only thing I've got designed that'll haul more than three Kerbals at a time into orbit reliably and be able to bring them back. I really wish they would come up with an S2 crew tank uh, configuration, which I've I've heard rumors that uh, a little birdie has told me that that's on the agenda, so that I could have a proper seven seven person shuttle without having to resort to putting a hitchhiker t uh, tank in the back, dropping the periaps over Kerbal Space Center. And once again, we're making a nighttime landing. I really prefer not doing these, but I wanted to get that HAB module dropped onto the moon as quickly as possible. It's just a gorgeous shot right here, though. I love that atmospheric haze, which when EVE Online first brought out their planet models, the one thing that I was just going absolutely nuts over, and my friends thought I was crazy, was if you look at the ter if you play Eve online and you see the Terminator bands where it goes from day to night, you'll see the uh, it actually has an orange hue to it. And anybody who knows basic physics, um, and this is kind of like something you'll learn in elementary or high school, but as the sun gets lower, it has to penetrate more of the atmosphere, and so it starts to um, all the uh, oh lord redshift blue shift. Uh, thinking either way the wavelength of the light is changed to where you mainly only see the red light um i'm sitting here saying it's elementary physics and i can't even remember let's see i believe redshift is stretched yes uh redshift would be um the, the wavelengths the light visible light wavelengths get stretched and so all you see are the red um, when it's up in the atmosphere, it's got a short. The rays have a shorter distance to penetrate to your eye, so that's where you mainly get it reflecting off oxygen, giving the sky the blue. But I thought it was so impressive that they would include that in their planets, and with better atmospheres and environmental visual enhancements, having that orange wisp over the horizon before day or night is probably one of my favorite features of it because the clouds are cool and all, but I play a lot of FSX, Flight Simulator 10, and I'm going to put some videos up of it because I finally got it reinstalled and working on my system a lot better. And I want to show off the uh, Alpha Sim Blackbird that I've had for years. But Back to the video at hand, though. We're going to chase the uh, combination of Skycrane and HAB module around for a bit just because I've got tons of Delta V in this upper stage, but I just don't really want to burn off all of it at once. So, I want to minimize as much. It doesn't have any docking ports, and I forgot to put a pod on it, so it's just going to orbit up there. But I can use KAS, and if it, if I ever need, am in need of resources in lunar orbit, I can fly an intercept with this and uh, send Jeb out with a siphon pump and drain off some LFO and monoprop. What I'm trying to do is much maneuvering 
with the refueling module as I can just to uh, because I don't care how much Delta V I burn off on this one I want to preserve as much as I can with the sky crane and the sky crane was never meant to do any really drastic orbital maneuvers it was meant to get itself into orbit get pretty close using just reaction wheels and engine thrust and then use its really tiny RCS tank just to make the final you know fine adjustments for the docking maneuver to bring whatever payload I need down so it really I didn't want to fly it out to the refueling module and then have to ditch the hab and then uh, dock with the refueling uh, station until I was very close Watch that range just drop off. Start using RCS to push that velocity vector close to, but not completely onto the uh, Skylab and HAB module. Just because uh, in orbit collisions are nasty things. Relative velocity would be really low, but I don't want to snap off one of these uh, solar panels. Really prefer to keep this intact if I can. And once again, just basic safety. I have put the all the docking ports on this thing, well, the one docking port, in a position where they will not interfere with that uh, solar array. Now we get close enough that I send the sky crane, start setting it up for the docking maneuver. And we're going to haul that ab module with us until we get there just because the closer it is to the fuel depot the less distance I have to travel to redock with it once I get refueled and again this thing was never meant to refuel off the that lower docking port so it's a little difficult trying to relearn all my landing, and you can see my strut brace on the uh, left side of it from here, from this perspective. The strut X has snapped. I'm going to have to use a Kerbal to uh, put some KAS struts in there to reinforce it, but not too much of a big deal. It's a little wiggly, but it's n well within parameters, what parameters you can design in a hastily slapped together piece of equipment. Which, a lot of people, <clears throat> one of the things that I think people are actually starting to appreciate more about Kerbal Space Program is they always ask, why don't my airplanes fly right? My airplanes don't fly like any of the airplane games I've ever played. It's like, well, the planes were flying, even my space shuttle. My space shuttle is the result of probably a good two years, not solid, but two years development cycle just starting off starting out with uh, some of the modded self hacked things I threw together in like point one eight or something and real aircraft real spacecraft have multiple years of development cycles in them ours you know we just kinda slap them together for function it needs this part it needs this science module well let's go for it so but yeah my I've designed uh, fighter type aircraft and they fly decently well but you're never gonna get to where like say something in FSX or uh, DCS world you can get pretty close though there are some really talented uh, designers out there my main issue when it comes to this is I've gotten a little uh, less trusting of Ferrum Aerospace's um, oh lord aerodynamic stress model just having the wing shear off the planes at the slightest provocation because a real wing is not attached to just the surface skin of a plane um, if you if you think of a car and you think of your chassis on an aircraft the chassis is actually not the fuselage so much as it is the wing structure because the wing has to support the entire weight of the aircraft the wing is without a doubt the most sophisticated and complicated and important piece of an aircraft. The fuselage is really just a bunch of hollow tubes, but the wing is an engineering marvel. Structurally, it's got to hold the entire thing together. And so having 
the wings fall off so easily in Ferrum. I still leave it active because it keeps me from pulling extreme maneuvers, but there's been a couple times in Sandbox where I've lost a shuttle or something, and I felt that it was a little bit arbitrary. Now that we've captured our uh, HAB module, I have to go back and make notes to see what biomes I've actually explored on the moon. Because I'd like to set this thing down on a place I haven't seen much of, so I can maximize my science return. But I also want to set it down to other biomes that haven't been exploited, maybe hopefully bringing them within rover range. I have no idea what the range of my rovers is going to be on the moon. Uh, with lower gravity, the motors don't have to work as hard to move the same amount of mass. So, we will see. It may not, uh, they may not have the range to get as far as I'm hoping they will, but... The main, the main issue is that driving them is going to have to be painfully slow. And I'm going to be cutting a lot out of those drives just because um, if I get my velocity too high, I run the risk of flying off the surface and then it's pretty much done. When we pick our landing site, we're aiming for a spot, a spot near the twin craters. Well, actually landing on the Midlands, which are the most exploited biome I've got, but I am i really think I'm going to be within driving distance of the Midland Craters and um, some of the, and, and obviously the Twin Craters. And I'm hoping that maybe using KAS I can plop some solar panels off and stick them to the rover so it can at least recharge during the day and make it to some further further out locations. Getting ready to start our deorbit burn. This is without a doubt the most uh, delicate part of the operation. Trying to land this while it's hanging from the sky crane because it's not totally rigid. It's on that docking port, and docking ports are not as stiff as, say, uh, node joints, like when you're clipping parts together. So it's got a little bit of wobble. It's not incredibly bad, but you know, just something to be aware of flying over our very first moon landing site and it's only now that I've noticed I've uh, I really focused all my explorations on that one area of the, of the moon so hopefully coming around back here and I don't believe the moon is tidally locked to Kerbin um, I could be wrong but I always thought it was but just uh, today I was playing it, and I, I really don't recall some of these uh, craters being on the Kerbin side. But again, it's been a while since I landed on the moon, and I really wasn't paying that much attention to it, so it could be totally locked. I'm, like I said, I'm not certain. The only reason this came up was because I was thinking about trying to maintain line of sight to Kerbin, or at least to its satellite network. Because I really didn't want to have this thing crash just because I ran out of... Uh, I ran out of range for my satellite network. And you can see there, it just barely got from that South Pole relay, and then it cuts out. And right as we're about to get to the... Uh, landing site, I finally get a signal from the satellite network. Just one more thing you gotta be aware of when playing with remote tech. I really need to put a better satellite network around the moon. Um, putting all those probes around Minmus was honestly probably a waste of time because I'm not gonna be spending... I'm gonna be going to Minmus a bit, but... I'm not going to be developing any large uh, infrastructure on the surface because the gravity is so low, it's, uh, it's just a pain to put anything interesting on there. Really, I could put a lander on the surface of Minmus, turn off the engine, and call it a base. It's probably about as advanced as things would ever get there. Start burning off that lateral velocity, trying to bring it down. I started the burn a little late. I wanted to be a little more directly north of the twin craters, but you can see those large craters, uh, the 
the three above the twins, that those are actually marked in the biome map, so they will give, they're not unique, they are the same biome amongst the three, but they're different from like the twin craters and the surrounding midlands. So I've only got to visit one. But I want to make sure I have a lo pretty much every scientific uh, instrument available to me, except for the barometer when I visit those. I'm gonna try to, and it's hard for me to judge distance on the moon. I just I don't I haven't spent a whole lot of time actually living on it or colonizing it to any extent to really get a feel for my distances. So this those craters could be a lazy day's drive away, or they could be just almost unreachable. But I think I can barely see the depression of the twins in that view, so that gives me hope. We fire up our lights. Landing during the daytime, but you know, never hurts to have your lights on. And those are not supposed to be navigation orientation lights. I just imagined that uh, Maybe say the uh, fuel port has a has an up and a down. There's a left side and a right side. I don't know. I just thought they looked cool. Either way, we could say the Kerb the Kerbals are getting ready for Christmas. Waiting for Santa Jeb to come down the chimney with a delivery of SRBs and ejection seats. But I've been, I've used this uh, sky crane concept, not this actual design. Uh, most of the ones I launched were in vanilla aerodynamics, so I never had to fit them into a fairing. But this has actually been a pretty efficient and successful way to, uh, for me, of bringing large payloads down to uh, airless bodies. Duna, I will be using parachutes, and everything's going to almost... If a parachute can't drop something on its own, which is very iffy given uh, Duna's atmospheric density, or lack thereof, um, pretty much everything is going to have to be self-propelled and self-contained. Um, I want to drop my Duna um, HAB module and pretty much the entire base uh, within... I'm going to send multiple launches all in the same window, and I want them all to arrive roughly in the same area. So that'll mean everybody's got to get into a synchronous orbit, and then we all drop off, have to synchronize our drops so everything lands in roughly the same area. Kind of a bouncy landing, but we get it there, and the reaction wheels, wheels help stabilize it so it won't fall the heck over. And this thing, unattached, like I said, the uh, that HAB module just about doubled the mass of this thing from what it is stock. And so you can see I've got more than enough delta V to get back up into orbit, but I'm going to probably refuel it on the ground and start shuttling loads with it that way. And that'll mean our next mission will have to be our manned mission with our keythane extractors and converters and maybe expand the HAB module a little bit. Nice pinpoint landing, and thank you for watching. Stay tuned for further episodes.